So there's this trend that I've been seeing on YouTube lately that I really like. I find it entertaining where other YouTubers will rank things that, you know, are of interest to them. Characters in Game of Thrones, fast food restaurants, other YouTubers. And I thought that since this is a political YouTube channel, it would make sense for me to kind of do my own ranking of the 2020 Democratic Party primary contenders. And as you can see here, we have the different categories. We have the S tier, which is obviously the best. It's top tier. And then we have the F tier, which obviously is the worst of the worst. Now, this is not me ranking them based on numbers. I think that we all know that Bernie Sanders is my first choice, but this isn't me saying this is my number one, my number two, so on and so forth. This is essentially me just categorizing the candidates based on how good they are. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, okay, so the very first one we have here is Governor of Washington, Jay Inslee. Thus far, I'm not super impressed by him. He hasn't really laid out um, anything other than saying that he wants to tackle climate change, which is phenomenal. This is a really important issue. But the problem is that why would we opt for him when there are other people who are better when it comes to this issue? I mean, Bernie Sanders is championing the Green New Deal. Tulsi Gabbard has introduced her own climate change legislation, the OFF Act. So why would I choose him? over them when there are better people on this issue. But nonetheless, the fact that he wants to raise awareness about this issue is still important. So he's certainly not S tier. He's not the worst of the worst, but I'm going to put him in about mid range. Um, I'm going to put him as C here because, you know, I just, I, I'm not interested in what he has to say. If you're only talking really about one issue and you don't have the credibility needed on that one issue. Okay, so the next person here is Mike Gravel, former Alaska senator, meme god, and I've said this before in the program, I actually agree with his platform more than pretty much anyone else. Um, better, It's better than Bernie's, it's better than Tulsi's, just objectively speaking. So in my view, this really is S tier, because he has the gold standard, he has the best platform in my view. And he goes further than people like Bernie Sanders and Tulsi Gabbard, even when it comes to their strengths. Like, he supports not using drones, which is something that is incredibly important to me. He explicitly is saying that Chelsea Manning, Edward Snowden, and um, Julian Assange should be pardoned. Now, Tulsi Gabbard has also spe spoken out about this, but just overall, when you look broadly at his platform, I think he has the best. Now, I feel comfortable putting him in the S tier because he actually doesn't want to be president. But just objectively speaking, if I had to rank the candidates based on how good their platform is, I mean, if I don't put him in S tier, I feel like this would be a crime. Next person, Andrew Yang. So I like Andrew Yang. I was part of the Yang gang from the beginning. I have an Andrew uh, Yang pin or actually two of them over here. And I think that he is extremely honest. He's truthful. However, I just don't agree with the policy ideas that he's proposing. He doesn't support Medicare for all. He's in favor of a public option instead. And I'm worried about his version of universal basic income. I think that if you're introducing universal basic income and it's supplementing existing social safety net programs, and you don't have to choose between UBI and social security, I would support him a lot more. He'd be like nearly top tier for me. But because he's not doing that yet until he proposes a plan to you know improve social security lift the tap the, the uh cap on taxable income then um you know he's not he's not a first choice for me we'll just say that so i'm gonna put him in b tier because he still has a lot of great ideas like ranked choice voting and whatnot but you know his main pitch of ubi i don't agree with the way he wants to implement that moving on we have Mary Ann Williamson. So this is someone overall who, um, I think she's a really nice person. Um, she doesn't support Medicare for all. She made this clear in an interview on the Jimmy Dore show. And if you don't support Medicare for all, I, I just, I'm sorry. I, I lose interest in you. 
I lose interest in you. But with that being said, she still has one strong policy that I really do support. She uh, believes in reparations for American descendants of slavery. Now, I actually think her plan is fairly meager. She's pitching $100 billion over 10 years, so $10 billion per year. And I think that they're owed more than that. I think we can do better. And also, I don't know that she's been explicit about that being a check. So I don't know for sure. Like, I, I previously gave her credit for being the best on this issue, but I'm not 100% sure. So I'm going to put her in B because this is the tier where you have one policy that I really like, but overall, I just can't get behind you because you don't check the boxes that I need you to check, namely Medicare for all. And also, I think she needs to lay off the platitudes because it is irritating to me. Um, she talks a lot about, you know, love and whatnot, but you've got to read the room. This is not an election where running on love, quote unquote, love, whatever you want to mean by that is going to win. Like, we are in a burn shit down era in politics. We don't feel love, we feel hatred. And we want someone who's going to destroy the establishment. And, you know, I said the same thing about Beto O'Rourke with his platitude, so the same is going to be applicable to Marianne Williamson. Next person here. Elizabeth Warren. So, I like Elizabeth Warren. Um, however, <laughs> with that being said... The problem that I have with Elizabeth Warren is that she won't unequivocally support Medicare for All. I mean, she's co-sponsored Bernie's Medicare for All bill, but anytime she's asked about it, she runs away from it. She says, well, yeah, I also co-sponsored, you know, a public option bill and lowering the age of Medicare down to 55, and I don't like that. However, I still think she's a phenomenal candidate. She proposed canceling some student loan debt. She keeps coming out with these really innovative policy ideas that I hadn't previously thought about, and I like her. The one thing that scares me about Elizabeth Warren is I don't know that she'd have the political courage to fight for anything. Like, we saw how she didn't have the courage to endorse Bernie Sanders. She didn't have the courage to stand up for the Standing Rock activists back in 2016 when they were being brutalized by militarized police. So I worry about her willingness to fight. With that being said, I still think that she is good enough to be an A tier because I genuinely believe that she's principled. Uh, fighting for what she wants to get implemented is a whole other story. But with that being said, um, you know, I like Elizabeth Warren. Next person, Eric Swalwell. So this Felicia is one of the 1,000 centrists who is running. And basically he's running on gun control, which is an issue I can get behind. But every single candidate supports gun reform. So this isn't really something that you're really setting yourself apart with. Like when it comes to someone like Tulsi Gabbard, I think it's incredibly brilliant for her to run on ending regime change wars because you have like one or two other candidates, if we're being extra charitable, who believe that we should do this. So that's innovative. This isn't very innovative to me. And also he's more of a centrist. He doesn't support Medicare for all. Um, he's just not great. Overall, I'm going to put him in the E tier. Um, because I don't think he is the worst of the worst. There's certainly worse out there, but he just, you know, um, we could do better than Eric Swalwell. Next person is Bernard. I am a brother of the Bernard. You all know, it looks like, you know, behind me, a Bernie Sanders fan club. Um, but Bernie Sanders is someone who I've supported since 2010 when I saw his epic filibuster on the house floor. And I just, I just knew that this guy was principled. And the more you dig into his record, the more you love him. He supports Medicare for all. He's the strongest on Medicare for all, which is my number one issue. And for that, you've got to give it up to him. Now, there are things that I disagree with Bernie Sanders on. He has got to improve when it comes to Israel-Palestine. But with that being said, sadly, he's still one of the best. He doesn't support BDS, but he still is more forceful in condemning Israel and what they do to Palestinians, the way that they kill them indiscriminately. He called Netanyahu a racist. And also, he has previously stated he'd kind of support drones. Now, he did make it clear that he'd take precautions to minimize civilian casualties, but nonetheless just end the program. It's illegal. Congress has not declared these drone wars. So, the executive should not be able to unilaterally wage war. This is the whole point of Bernie Sanders, you know, touting, you know, his bill on Yemen, which was fantastic. But with that being said, 
these disagreements aside, they're not deal breakers by no means. And these are just a couple of disagreements. I agree with Bernie Sanders on the overwhelming majority of policies. And I think that he's the one person who actually knows how to get his legislative agenda implemented in the event he becomes president. He's the only person who truly wants to get us to social democracy. And even if his platform in and of itself is not as good as Mike Ravel's, just out of pure strategy, out of consistency, he's definitely S-tier. Phenomenal candidate, as you all know. I mean, it's not like I have to convince you guys because you already know how I feel about Bernie, but he's great. Next person, another Felicia here. We have Tim Ryan. Now, Tim Ryan, if you recall, he challenged Nancy Pelosi in uh, I believe 2016, um, or maybe it wasn't 2016. Basically, he was running against Nancy Pelosi to be speaker. But even if we don't like Nancy Pelosi as progressives because she's a conservative, if you could believe it, he was challenging her from the right. So he's a conservative. I see no reason why he wants to run. Um, I don't think there's really a place for him. Um, so I'm going to put him in the F tier. He's basically the worst that we can possibly do. I don't care. Um, and really, he's not that much different from Eric Swalwell, Swalwell here. Um, but, I mean, what are you running on? Like, at least with Eric Swalwell, he has something that he's running on. Like, he says, I want gun reform because that's the one thing that won't offend the plethora of special interests that contribute to his campaign because he's not going to be taking money from, you know, GOA or NRA. But, I mean, it's something. What is Tim Ryan offering? What is he running on? I don't know. I don't know what it is. You know, incrementalism, more neoliberalism, no thanks. So not not cool with him. Beto O'Rourke. This is someone who he's bad. <laughs> he's just so bad. Um, he's pretty much an empty vessel. I feel like he doesn't have any ideas, any platforms. And if you put him in power, what he's going to carry out, his agenda will essentially be dictated by his advisors. He'd be the left equivalent of Donald Trump. Now, he has some great ideas. He wants to legalize marijuana. Awesome. Uh, he did support Medicare for All, and then once he decided to run, flipped on it. Um, he, however, is raising money based on bundlers. You know, he is teaming up with oligarchs who donate to Democrats. He's just someone who is not consistent and overall has a very conservative record. Now, in the race against Ted Cruz, I was incredibly supportive of him because I would literally, I would support a turd over Ted Cruz. And I'm not being hyperbolic. If you gave me the choice between Ted Cruz and a literal piece of shit, I would vote for that piece of shit over Ted Cruz. So, I mean, I supported him back then, but in 2020, I don't know why he's running. And I don't think he knows why he's running. And that is, you know... um, it shows why he face-planted, because he is vacuous. He has nothing. Um, so I'm going to put him in the C tier. Certainly not the worst of the worst. Certainly not the best of the best. I, I'm kind of... I kind of want to move him to D tier, because he's really bad. Yeah, I'm going I'm to move him to D tier, just because I don't know what he's running on. Besides legalizing marijuana, which I support, I don't know what... He's running on. I don't know why Beto O'Rourke feels like he's the person who, you know, um, should win when he doesn't really have new ideas. Okay, so let's go to Seth Moulton, another one of the Felicias. I consider the F category the Felicia category, a bunch of white dudes with basically the same policy. I mean, they should really, I, I saw a tweet about this. These guys should all be running as one person because they're the same fucking person. But Seth Moulton, he's someone who tried to challenge Nancy Pelosi um, from the right. And that failed spectacularly. I believe he got booed by his own constituents at a town hall. He recently came out against Medicare for All and said he supports a public option. Um, in addition to the ACA, I just, I don't, I don't know why he's running. Um, there's no really one signature issue that sets him apart. So he goes in the F tier. The only reason why, and to be clear, the reason why I'm not putting Swalwell in the F tier is because, I mean, these guys don't have something that they're running on that is noticeable, at least. Again, Swalwell says guns. That's something that tells me that you have one reason why you're running, even if it's something that isn't that innovative, you know, or wouldn't be super transformative. It's something, you know, so credit where it's due. But yeah, Moulton is one of the Felicias. The next person is 
Wayne Massam. Now, this is someone who I don't know too much about, but I will say this. He is basically an incrementalist. He doesn't support Medicare for All. He, you know, he wants to get dark money out of politics. He He's more of an incrementalist, with the exception of one policy that is amazing. He goes further than Elizabeth Warren when it comes to student loan debt cancellation. He actually straight up is adopting Jill Stein's policy. We take the $1.5 trillion that 45 million Americans or 44 million Americans hold, cancel all of it, full stop. Now, for that, I'm going to put him in the B category because that is such a bold thing to run on that I've got to give you credit there because if you are running on something that bold, that really does set you apart. Like, look at these people. We have in the B category, we have Yang. He's running on UBI, which I support in theory, just not necessarily his implementation. We have Williamson, who supports reparations. Um, I think it's not the best reparations proposal that we can come up with. It's still something that I support. And we have Massam with um, student loan debt cancellation. So in the B tier, what I kind of see here, um, based on my own trend of categorizing these people, is they're, by and large, you know, they have one big policy that really sets them apart from the rest of the field. And I think it's fair to put Massam in this category. Um, so we have Amy Klobuchar, another Felicia candidate. Um, I don't know why she's running. Um, I don't know why she chose to eat salad with a comb. <laughs> and I will never get past that. I'm sorry. Never, ever, ever going to get past that. Um, I don't know where to put her. Let's see. She's certainly in the Felicia category. I think she's part of the white men who should be running as one person. But with that being said, she actually is proposing some policy ideas. She's like a boring version of Elizabeth Warren where she's talking about, you know, having these savings accounts for your uh, tuition. It's incredibly bad, just incrementalist, neoliberal nonsense. But I mean, it's she's trying, I guess. So I'll put her in the E category, I guess. I don't know. See, she kind of, it could go either way. She could be in the F category. She could be in the E category, but I'll be extra kind and I'll put her in the E category just because she has given me joy because of this salad with a comb kerfuffle that I can't stop talking about and uh, thinking about. Next person, John Hickenlooper. He watched porn uh, with his mom, F. He also compared Bernie Sanders' policies to Stalin's. Um, so I think that he's just not a bright guy. Um, former governor of Colorado, I think, would know the difference between Stalin <laughs> and Bernie. But nonetheless, he is uh, feigning ignorance here. And he watched porn with his mom. Nope. Kamala Harris. Oops, I just flipped her. Sorry, hang on. Okay, Kamala Harris. She is someone who I consider her the best of the worst. She's definitely a corporate Democrat, but she stands out among all of the other corporate Democrats because she, I believe, is more politically astute. She's more savvy when it comes to strategy. And she knows that she has to do two things. One, she knows she can't piss off her donors in the Democratic Party if she wants to win, but she also knows that she can't piss off progressives like Hillary Clinton did if she wants to win. So she's savvy, she knows what she's doing, and she's certainly more charismatic than the other corporate Democrats. I'm going to go ahead and put her in the C tier. Um, if there was any Democrat that stood out, or really that remained, you know, it, it, let's just picture this situation where it is March, and there's two candidates left, and Bernie was there obviously running against another corporate Democrat, which is what I think will probably happen. That's how the race will be consolidated. One progressive, one corporatist. I would hope it's Kamala Harris because at least she is better than the rest of them. Okay, next person, Kirsten Gillibrand. Pretty much the same is true for Kirsten Gillibrand. She comes out in favor of really bold policies like abolishing ICE, but at the same time, even though she knows, like Kamala, that she can't piss off progressives and her donors simultaneously and she's trying to walk this fine line, the problem is that 
she goes against her own better judgment. Like she just had a fundraiser with a big pharma executive. That's completely unacceptable in 2020 in an anti-establishment election. So for that, she's not as good as Kamala Harris in my view. Um, she also doesn't want to get rid of the filibuster. And I just don't think she's as malleable as someone like Kamala Harris. Like worst case scenario, Kamala Harris is elected. Well, that's actually not the worst case scenario, but in not the best case scenario where Bernie is elected, I think that Kamala would be easier to persuade to do certain policies than Kirsten Gillibrand. Because once she's elected, I feel like she just pretty much tells us to fuck off. Whereas with Kamala Harris, I think she would be more mindful of the fact that she needs to maintain the support of the progressive base if she wants to be, you know, effective as a leader. Because if you lose our support, we're not going to make phone calls for you. We're not going to come out and canvas for you. So Harris knows this. Harris is more aware. She's more in tune with the base, I think. So for that reason, I think that Gillibrand, she kind of is in this D tier where just not great, but not the worst. Next person, Tulsi Gabbard. Now, Tulsi Gabbard is someone who I really, really admire. She is just, she carved out this lane for herself and you've got to give her credit. She's running on ending the regime change wars. Now, like Bernie Sanders, I don't think she's perfect. I wish that she would include ending the drone war as part of her platform. But with that being said, she's pretty much an amazing candidate. She's nearly perfect. Now, I do have other criticisms of Tulsi Gabbard, but none of them, like Bernie Sanders, are deal breakers. But with that being said, Tulsi Gabbard, for my number one issue, she doesn't speak to this enough. She's one of two people that hasn't backed away from Medicare for All. But what I'm looking for is for her to explicitly say, we need to do away with private health insurance companies. Because that's really the way that you secure a very stable single payer system. Now, she doesn't necessarily have to say, let's make private insurance, supplemental insurance illegal. But I mean, the goal is to craft a single payer system that is so good that they basically go out of business. And when it comes to, you know, more elective procedures, things that you might need to finance, like braces or breast augmentation, for example, things that aren't, you know, of concern for your health. I mean, you finance this. You don't really need insurance for that either. But with that being said, um, I'm not going to get too nitpicky because Tulsi's phenomenal. She's an amazing candidate. I'm going to put her in the A tier. Now, she's here with Warren for me, and I kind of feel like she's a step above Warren, in my view, like I've been struggling genuinely about who's my number two. If there was like a tier between S and A, um, I would probably put Gabbard there and leave Warren in A. And the main reason why I do this is because Gabbard doesn't run away from Medicare for all like Warren. And Gabbard is also someone who is strong. Like I genuinely believe that if she says we're going to end regime change wars, if she gets elected, she's ending the regime change wars. And if the establishment and media want to fight her on that, she's not going to back down from that fight because I believe that Tulsi Gabbard, she has political courage. She endorsed Bernie. Warren did not. She went to Standing Rock in 2016. Warren did not. So Gabbard, really, she sets herself apart by being bold, by being strong, by being courageous, and by really just having this amazing platform when it comes to ending regime change wars. And if you watched an ad that she put out where somebody went to one of her rallies and was crying because of her stance on regime change wars and how much that meant to this person, she really had this intimate moment where she hugged that person. It was phenomenal. Tulsi is really, she's great. So she's definitely A tier um, with Elizabeth Warren. Okay, John Delaney. One of the Felicias who should be running as one person, F tier, he really is not running on anything and there's no excitement for his campaign. Like if you look at some of the photos that he's posting on his Twitter, there's like five people that show up to his events, like literally. I don't know why he's running. He, uh, he's just seemingly an anti-Trump person and wants to get elected to restore decorum. Okay, but what does that do for us? You're going to do the same, largely, you know, largely the same policies as Trump, but nicer. Who cares? <laughs> I want change and he doesn't want to change the system. So he's basically worst of the worst. Um, next person, Julian Castro. Um, 
I'm going to put him in C. I think that this guy is a weasel, but he's not the worst of the corporate Democrats. He actually is paying lip service to the idea of Medicare for all. However, I don't believe he'd actually implement it. I don't believe he would fight for that. He's talking a big game when it comes to reparations. Don't believe he'd actually push for that. In fact, he criticized Bernie for not going far enough on reparations when he basically signaled support for the same thing that Bernie Sanders supports. So this guy is a weasel, but with that being said, I think he, like Kamala, knows he needs to at least, at a, min at a minimum, pander to progressives. And I don't like being pandered to, but you've got to give him credit for the effort at least, I guess. Um, actually, I'm kind of, I'm kind of rethinking C. Do I move him... To D. Yeah, I'm going to move him to D. This dude's a corporate Democrat. He came from Obama's administration. He's a corporate Democrat. Okay, next person. Pete Buttigieg. Um, he is D. Actually, he, you know what? He may even be E. Actually, no, no, no. I'll tell you why I'm going to put him in D. So, even though he's a centrist, he does have some good ideas that I support. First of all, he supports getting rid of the Electoral College. Don't need to support him for that, though, because Elizabeth Warren agrees. He also has a really good court-packing plan that would add six more justices to the Supreme Court, but also move to depoliticize the Supreme Court. I really like that plan. However, he's not going in this category in the B tier with Massam, Williamson and Yang, because the problem with Buttigieg is even though he has this one policy that I really like, he also has some ideas that I absolutely disagree with. Like, first of all, he's not great on Venezuela. He basically is pro-meddling. He floated the idea of compulsory national service. Fuck out of here. Hate that idea. Hate that policy. And he also said that candidates need to talk more about their values and put that front and center rather than talking about policies. No, thank you. Okay, Cory Booker. He's someone who I'd also put in the D tier. He's basically indistinguishable from the rest of these people. In fact, you know what? You could make the case that he belongs in E tier basically because of that vote for, um, or the vote against Amy Klobuchar's bill, and it's funny that she's lower than him, to allow us to import cheaper prescription drugs from Canada. But the difference is that he co-sponsored Medicare for All. Will he actually deliver Medicare for All as president? No way, because he's already moved away like Kamala Harris from it. But he's just a lot more corporatist than someone like Kamala Harris, I think. And they're both corporatists. But there's something unique about Booker in that he's such a slimeball that I really don't believe anything that he has to say. Um, so with Kamala, I believe that she'd get in and she'd try to maintain at least some level of support from progressives. Like, she'd offer us a few concessions, whereas Booker would just be another Democrat like Bill Clinton and Obama, where he's just going to work to appease his donors. So we got a couple left. Joe Biden. Joe Biden is F tier. He essentially is the worst of the worst. In fact, if I could put him in a lower tier than F... I would do it because Joe Biden has basically been on the wrong side of every single issue. While Bernie Sanders was protesting segregation, he was making speeches in favor of segregation functionally. He was on the wrong side of history when it comes to DOMA. He voted to federally ban same-sex marriage. Now he's come around and I welcome your evolution, but nonetheless, at that time, Bernie Sanders was on the right side of that issue. He voted for NAFTA. He was in support of the TPP. He voted for permanent normal trade relations with China. He's basically a hawk. He's a conservative corporate Democrat. And this guy is a paper tiger. He likes to talk tough. He likes to make it seem as if he's the best bet to go against Donald Trump because he has a big mouth. But that, that doesn't mean anything. You just have a big mouth and that's that. So Joe Biden is the worst of the worst, and I truly hope that Democrats defeat him because in the event he becomes the nominee, well, we're replicating the same strategy that cost us 2016, right? And I say us loosely because I don't necessarily associate myself with Democrats. I'm more of an independent, but 
I have to register as a Democrat because I'm in a closed primary state. So I'm not going to be able to vote for Bernie if I don't register as a Democrat. So temporarily, at least for all intents and purposes, I'm a Democrat. And if we don't beat him, we replicate the same strategy in 2016. Put up a corporatist who we know Trump has the capacity to defeat. Not a fan. Last person here. Bennett. He's a senator. And he's another Felicia, basically running on the same thing that the rest of the Felicias are running on. I'm going to put him in F tier. And largely for the same reasons that, you know, I, I categorized Seth Moulton and Tim Ryan here as well. Um, he just isn't really running on anything. It's more incrementalism. It's, you know, these half measures. And if you're not running with these big ideas to fundamentally change the system, or if you come up short there, if you're not running with one really strong policy proposal, then why are you even running? So in this category here, F and E, these people, these eight people should all be running as one person because... They're functionally the same thing, and I'm fully aware of the fact that you could almost put Buttigieg and O'Rourke here. But because they have a couple of good ideas, like, you know, we have abolishing the Electoral College, legalizing marijuana, also legalizing marijuana, that's why they're kind of in this category. Um, and with the E category, you know, we have these neoliberals proposing incrementalist ideas, but, I mean, it's something. These guys aren't doing shit. They're basically just... They're running because they're running. <laughs> there's, there's no driving core ideology behind them. They're vacuous. They're vapid. They're, you know, they're not talking about policies. What are you running on? Why are you running? So overall, let's just kind of take a moment here because we have everyone now. And for the most part, as you can see, just overall, I'm not too uh, big of a fan of most of the contenders. Half of the field is in, you know, these lower tiers because they suck. They're not great. But in this higher tier, you know, it's... You're never going to have a candidate who is perfect, who agrees with you on everything, but with these four candidates, we're pretty damn close. Like, we're, we're pretty fucking close. I mean, you have Bernie Sanders, who is a revolutionary, who actually wants social democracy, which in my view is important. And just getting us on the trajectory of social democracy, even if he gets one one hundredth of his agenda implemented, I think is better than what everyone else is proposing. You have Elizabeth Warren and Tulsi Gabbard, who I would love to vote for in the event they won. I would enthusiastically support either one of them. And then you have Mike Ravel, who has a phenomenal platform, but doesn't actually want to be, you know, president. But if he's going to promote progressive policy ideas on that debate stage... I'm behind it. And then you have people who I generally admire, probably Miss Sam less so than Yang and Williamson. But, you know, their one bold idea isn't enough to get my support. And then you have these mid-range candidates who are just, eh, don't like them. But um, they're certainly the best of the worst here. So that is my thoughts on this. I'm curious to know how you guys rank the candidates. And listen, um, I'm fully aware of the fact that many people will disagree with this, and you can disagree. Um, you could really make the case in some instances that the E people belong in the F tier. You can make the case that Warren and Gabbard belong in the S tier. You can make the case that Sanders belongs in the A tier, and Mike Gravel alone should be in the S tier. There's a lot of ways that you can cut it, but this is just my personal view. By and large, these four candidates here, they're my people. I like them, and um, I think they're great. So I know it's gonna, going to kind of be like a pain in the ass to type this out in the comments, but I am curious to see how close we agree, and I also want to know what other political commentators think. So I hope to see Kyle Kalinske, Rational National, Jimmy Dore, Nico House, Tim Black, Kim Iverson, Anna Kasparian, uh, Michael Brooks. I want to see everyone do the same thing. Um, just because I'm I'm curious because, you know, this is, it's tricky. We have so many candidates running that I think that these types of exercises, it is helpful because when you kind of can put them all out here like this and really visualize what tier they belong in and how good of a candidate they are, I do believe it is helpful. But with that being said, people are probably going to disagree with this and that's perfectly fine. 
Um, but you know, this is this is my categorization. This is how I rank the candidates. Um, but I'm curious to know what you think. And I'm sorry, you know, I don't like name drop dropping other political commentators because you're almost always gonna leave someone out, which pisses people off. So if I left you out, then um, I don't mean any harm by it. I, I'm not doing that on purpose. But um, you know, I, I I'm curious to see how other people would categorize the candidates. My next thing I think is. I'm thinking about ranking them just one through 21 or 22, however many people are running and seeing, you know, who's my number one and who is my number 22. Um, because that's something that's also interesting, but I'm still genuinely struggling when it comes to who's my um, number two or number three, if you include, you know, Gravel, but I don't really put him as my number one because he doesn't actually want to be president. So I've ranked Bernie as number one. And I'm still, I go back and forth between Warren and Gabbard because on one hand, I like Warren's student loan debt cancellation plan, but I like that Gabbard talks more about regime change wars. I trust that Gabbard will fight and has more courage than Warren. So it's a struggle for me. You know, um, I've, I've gone back and forth, so I don't know how I would rank them. I'd probably still tie them overall because they're both excellent candidates and I like them both very much. I bought t-shirts for them both. I bought buttons for them both. And I love them. But, you know, Bernie's definitely my number one. Um, and yeah, after that, it gets a little bit tricky. But anyways, I'm going to stop talking. This is uh, my rankings.